There we go. Daniel, take it away. Daniel and Jared. All right. Um, so this talk is going to be about uh, common performance pitfalls and how to avoid them, and also some tools uh, to diagnose them, uh, tools and, and practices. So um, this is a look at the yeah. agenda for the common pitfalls that we're going to be going over. Um, yeah, we can move on to the next slide. <laughs> so the first problem we're going over is the n plus one query problem, um, which is pretty common to do in Django. And the basic premise is that you do one query, expecting to operate on all the data in the query, but then you end up performing an extra n queries by right, each single data item in the query. So this is uh, pretty common to trigger because when you do a query in Django, the query only returns the instance for the, that model. It doesn't return any extra data for a relationship data. And so if you access any attribute on a re related model, then you're going to trigger an extra database query. So this is very common if you're writing a serializer for your model. And so this is an example from Pulpansible where we have a tag serializer for a tag model, and it has a related field for collections and a calculated field for getting the count, which uses another related model. And so for these two fields, if they're serializing, you're going to perform an extra two database queries for every uh, tag that you're serializing, which can be quite slow. So the solution to this problem is to make sure that when you're using a query, you always try to get as much data as you can in one query. And so for a solution for the previous problem, you use select related along with annotate, and now your query is only performing in one query to the database instead of n plus one. Another cool special case that is unique to Django is that if you just need the PK of a related field, you don't need to actually perform any select related. You can just use this underscore ID nomenclature. And so if you do book.author.pk, you're going to trigger an extra database query. But if you do book.author underscore ID, which is added by default by Django as part of their magic, then you don't uh, perform an extra database query. So the second major pitfall, so the first one was you're not bringing in enough data. The second pitfall, major pitfall is that you bring in way too much data. Um, so Django tries to load every um, piece of data from your query into memory all at once so that it can be cached. But if your table is very, very big, or your model just has a lot, a lot of fields, then this can easily overload your system and make your memory usage go up very, very high or make your database get hammered. So the, uh, if you suspect that the table is going to be very large, which in pulp, a lot of our tables can get very, very big. You want to make sure that you're only using the select data that you need or that you know you're going to be operating on. So using the only values, values list, iterator, and page and slice slicing. But here's a common example that we use in our migration code where we expect where we're making the changes on the model. And we expect that our users can have loads and loads of instances in their database. And we don't want this migration to die on, on their machine or take very long. So what we do is we uh, use an iterator first, and this makes it so that it'll only load the objects in batches, usually I think a default of 2,000. And then we use a list to store the objects that we're using in, a, in two chunks. And then we do bulk updates on those chunks and then clear out the, the list and then keep doing it again and again. This way, we keep the memory usage down and make sure that the uh, it goes much faster. <laughs> the, the, there is a caveat, uh, which is that if you use um, not only and then you end up using those fields anyway, uh, you kind of go back to triggering n plus one queries. Um, so you do have to be careful, um, kind of finding the uh, the right balance between querying too much and uh, and accidentally not querying enough, um, especially, you know, as code changes over time, um, stuff like that can creep in. 
And uh, this has been, a, been us a number of times, unfortunately. Um, this is another thing you can do. Uh, so if you're using uh, select related um, to avoid additional queries, um, again, and that's helpful because um, you uh, do a, you do a query all the additional data up front um, instead of potentially triggering more queries later. Um, but using dot only in combination with select related can be tricky, um, and you don't want to uh, you don't want to necessarily query every field of information from the table that you're running select related over, um, and so uh, dot values or dot values list. Uh, can be helpful uh, to uh, fetch specifically the fields you want, um, including across foreign key relationships, um, especially especially when you're doing a lot of queries across foreign key relationships. Uh, this can be helpful. Um, Jared. So um, to Identify over serialization. This can be quite tough for us developers since our machines are usually working with a very small database and very limited data. So we probably won't ever reach the limits of our uh, queries. So the main uh, way is just just uh, intuition by your when you're expecting code. Be wary of each ORM call, especially when you're doing for loops over the, the uh, a query. Just know that if you're not using iterator or using values lists. And you're probably bringing in every single item in, in uh, the database table. And the second key way is to use profiling. Ideally, test it on a machine with much larger resources and a way bigger database than us developers use. Uh, so the third um, major pitfall is getting overly complex with your query especially in an uh, attempt to try to do more or be more optimized. Um, the RRM allows us to do a lot of cool things, but it does hide the actual SQL that is being generated and run on the database. So it can be quite easy to just create a pretty obscene uh, SQL queries that can really hammer the database. And so some two um, big uh, tips that you can use to avoid extra Complexity is be careful when you're ORing queries together, because this can make a very monstrous query. And be careful when you're doing many, many cross table lookups in one query. So here's an example that uh, Daniel just recently fixed in uh, Pulp RPM, where in the distribution tree, they were ORing all of these artifact queries together. Uh, and each artifact query is already using a self query within that content PK in. And so you're basically performing the same query in amount of times for every single distribution tree. Just uh, the query is crazy complex. And the solution is on the next slide. Yeah. And, and hard for the PostgreSQL um, query planner to optimize. So when you get too complex, the solution, try to go back to making it simple again. So in this case, while it is you know, usually a good idea to try to make it one uh, query instead of multiple, going back and just performing multiple smaller queries in this case, so then you can perform a bigger query was the, uh, it's the right call. So first you convert all the, uh, the PKs that you want into a set, and then once you got all into one set, then you can do one bigger query. Yep. Um, so dot iterator. Um, talked about this a little bit earlier. If you plan to iterate over a large data set uh, or you use a query set only once, uh, it can be really helpful to use dot .iterator. Um, the reason is that uh, when a Django query set is executed, um, the results are cached in memory, uh, which does make subsequent accesses potentially cheaper. Like if you're indexing into that query set over and over again, uh, or if you're using it as a list, basically, um, iterating it over, over and over again. <laughs> but if you're only doing it once, um, then it's just needless overhead. Um, 
you don't need the caching uh, dot iterator is useful to help prevent Django from caching the results. And you know when again when it's a large table um, dot iterator is pretty important um, because otherwise you're just loading the whole thing in memory at once. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, we in in many places we do use uh, a lot of these approaches at once. Um, so as you can see, uh, this query uses dot iterator. Um, it also uses dot values, although that part of it isn't in this screenshot. It's hard to heck them these a bit weird about um, cutting off uh, cutting off things. Um, this is how much you can fit on this slide. But um, so you can see uh, we're using values, the, the dot values method um, to, uh, well, one, that avoids, it avoids the overhead of taking this data and shoving it into a, a, an object, like a Python object. That can actually be relevant um, with some of these um, really big, query sets, like I've measured a difference just between using dot values list and dot values and um, and uh, uh, assume the query set is normal. Um, and, and that's just from the object construction overhead. Um, but also you can see here, so uh, this content underscore underscore RPM package underscore underscore checksum type, um, that's, you know, multiple uh, multiple foreign key um, traversals. So that's so that would um, that would generally be very tricky, uh, very very tricky to um, uh, uh, do that without um, uh, uh, to, to only and and sorry, I'm getting off. Uh, uh, my brain's not working. Okay, so our cam packages are quite large. Um, there's a lot of metadata, uh, a lot, um, like files and change logs. Um, if you were to uh, select all of that metadata at once uh, by select related, it would be very inefficient, um, especially in this case where all we need is the checksum type and the package ID. Um, it's the only thing this query is using. Um, and so uh, using dot values list, or sorry, or dot values uh, to fetch specifically those fields um, while also avoiding like the, you know, n plus one um, is very helpful. Uh, I believe we actually originally were using dot only and select related here. Um, and Ina discovered that it wasn't working. And so she re rewrote this and fixed it and it got, um, much better. Um, so the way to identify these overly complex queries um, is to use the dot explain feature of the ORM, which just calls the explain method in SQL. Uh, and if you get the result, you can paste it into a website like this, that depth C, to uh, get a nice explanation of what Postgres is doing. It's always good to see what uh, both what the Django produces for the ORM and then what Postgres is actually planning on doing when it executes the query. Um, and then when you're looking at these, the output result, a good uh, tip is to look for any se sequential scans performed on a large number of rows. Uh, this is usually a good sign that either you need to restructure your query so that it's using a better uh, lookup method or you need to add an index to the field that you're querying over. Some other helpful tools that um, you can use for all of these problems: uh, the Django Debug Toolbar and Silk. I prefer I prefer using Silk because it gives you a nice UI. And then for profiling, there's the classics C profile, Py instrument, and this new one PySwy. I think you uh, added this one, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, well, PySpy is well. PySpy is not especially new, and I think PyInstrument actually uses PySpy. It's kind of like a wrapper around it. Um, but they, it is useful in its own right um, 
for certain specific things, and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so first, uh, so here's some examples of like silk. Um, I think this particular example is from some improvements that Jared made. Uh, Jared, do you want to talk about? Yeah. So the reason why I like silk is, you know, outside of the uh, nice UI, is that it allows you to um, see the aggregates or a bunch of different times you hit an endpoint. And so you can make a code change, hit the endpoint, make another code change, and then you can compare and contrast them side by side. And so this is when I was um, adding select-related data to the, uh, the query sets for the content so that we are removing the n plus 1 query problem. And as you can see, it has a huge impact. For just 100 items in the query, it was doing an extra, what is that, 1,400 queries to the database. Um, so. Yeah, and it, it was a huge improvement. I mean, you can just see from the time it got like 15 times better. It's quite significant. I just realized that you have to read it from right to left. I was reading the other way and it's like, it looks like it got worse. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe I should have uh, changed the filter so it reversed it. That's okay. I just, I wasn't paying attention to the timestamps. And uh, yeah. another aspect of Dangerous Silk is that you can actually look at each, the queries perform each request. Um, so this is what, what it, the optimized version of the content endpoint afterwards, where we're performing just one query. Oh, and you can also see the number of joins. So if you're hitting a bunch of joins, it's another good sign that, or another bad sign that the query might uh, be doing too much. And you can actually drill down into like the specific SQL um, that was used and like what what line triggered it, um, which is cool. Um, the the one important thing about uh, Django Silk is that it really only works with the API. Um, anything behind the tasking system um, or or the content app, um, it's not going to work for. Well, I don't know. Probably works for the content app because I don't know. Uh, uh, Jared, does it work for the content app? No, it does not. No. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't really <laughs> um, but it like it's extremely useful for like the API. Uh, definitely worth uh, taking a look at. Um, and they also have like some specific profiling decorators you can use. Um, like once you find a, a problem area in one of your request handlers, you can like add additional profiling to it. And um, and then like get uh, you know a profile what's taking CPU time beyond like the queries because the queries are generally the issue but um, you know there's always stuff going on outside the queries and sometimes that can be the issue too and so um, the profiling uh, can help with that. Um, so by instrument. Uh, this was recently added. Um, it's now available behind the task diagnostics, task diagnostics flag. If you uh, change that in your settings.py, um, it's very easy to enable. Uh, you do have to install the Py instrument package for it to work. Um, so it's an additional package you have to install. And there are some caveats, and I'll get to that. Um, but as you can see, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, it gives you um, kind of a, a list of the call stacks and what what was taking the most time. Um, so, 100% of the time spent in pullback support, but then you you break it down into different functions, export artifacts and tar file add and you know compression and checksumming and um, it was very useful. And I believe, as I said, uh, that PyInstrument is based on PySpy. Um, caveat, so it does require an additional package to be installed. Um, for very long running tasks that are like 20 minutes or more, there's a significant memory leak. And so we were having problems with running out of memory um, for 
very long running tasks. Of course, we don't have that many tasks that sh should take like 20 minutes, but it's worth keeping in mind, especially if you're doing like a, an immediate mode sync uh, that includes all the downloading. Um, it unfortunately, because of this, it kind of invalidates the memory tracking uh, that we have in place also by the task di diagnostics flag. So uh, basically if you enable this flag, uh, it'll create a directory in var temp pulp um, with the name of the, um, the name of the directory being the uh, task ID. And inside that directory, it'll drop a couple files, one of which is a, uh, uh, a data file um, that basically tracks the RSS of the process over time, the memory usage, resident set size. And the other which, uh, if you have the package, uh, the Pi instrument package installed, is the profile. Um, unfortunately, at, as of the current moment, like if you're using the profiling, it, it kind of uh, blows out the memory usage and makes it the memory usage graph not especially useful. Um, also, it seems like it doesn't work very well on sync tasks. Uh, the PyInstrument documentation says that it works fine with uh, async, but I think because our task start is not async, and then uh, spawn, then and then go into an async event pool instead of like um, starting there, uh, it, it kind of breaks PyInstrument. So. I think there's a little bit of work to do to make it work better for sync tasks. Um, but like, despite all of these caveats, it's still like extremely, extremely helpful um, and definitely worth uh, checking out. Um, PySpy. Uh, so PySpy is a sampling profile, uh, sorry, sampling profiler. It attaches itself to the interpreter and takes regular snapshots of the call stack. Um, this is in comparison to something like C profile, where uh, basically it uh, uh, injects hooks and on, on every transition, like every every single line or every single function call uh, will be logged with C profile, um, which is more creates more overhead. It actually is not more accurate um, despite you know, you would think that uh, logging every single function call uh, would be more accurate, but it turns out it's not necessarily the case um, because there's even more overhead from all that tracking. Um, and it's especially useful when a task is stuck and you're not sure why. Uh, you can run a PySpy dump uh, on a already running process. You don't you don't have to um, change anything about the way the code is being run. Like you can just ask it to attach to and dump the call stack of an already running process. So if you just figure out the P the PID of the um, uh, uh, process that's running your task, um, you can dump exactly what it's doing right now, um, which is very useful. Um, like if it's waiting on a query or, or anything else, uh, waiting on a lock. Um, Pies by top is also useful. Um, it basically works like normal top, except uh, with function calls. So, um, you know, wherever uh, wherever your process is spending most of its, whichever function uh, your process is spending most of its time in, it will show those uh, like at the top. And I had some GIFs, um, unfortunately, but. Uh, HackMD does not display GIFs. Like it just doesn't work at all. Um, but they have some cool, uh, they have some cool examples on the website. It looks like this. So it's very nice, very helpful. I just couldn't get these uh, to display in the uh, presentation for some reason. But yeah, that's it. Very cool.
Um, we're actually at the top of the hour, but the next session is an open session, so we can go a little longer. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask of Daniel or Jared on this? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm wondering how all this profile uh, can I just set it up in my development environment and how uh, tricky is it to get it running for pipe specific stuff? Uh, it's not very tricky at all. Um, at least with uh, so with Pi Instrument, uh, all you have to do is install the package and go into your settings.py and turn on uh, task diagnostic uh, task diagnostics. Um, here I will, and we have this documented in our um, configuration docs. Um, so it's, it's not that difficult to turn on. With PySpot, you just need to install it. Um, I mean, the hardest thing would be figuring out what the PID of your task is and doing it quickly enough to, um, I mean, if for short running tasks, PySpot, like, not really that helpful. But if it's a long running task and not sure why it's long running um, and it just doesn't seem like it's ever finishing, um, then uh, PySpot can be really helpful. Okay, cool. That sounds easy enough. Thanks. And to quickly identify the PID, uh, what worked for me, I whether uh, doubled down the number of workers to one, so I don't look for the worker out of, I don't know, eight workers I have, or you just use PSO OFX and grab for the running worker. This is how you can quickly find the PID. Okay, thanks. Karen, task diagnostics itself is do, is one, just one of the pulp settings that you can find in the configuration guide. Um, I'll point out, guys, that task diagnostics, at least in the doc that I'm looking at, only talks about memory. It doesn't, doesn't mention any of this stuff in it yet. Am I looking at the wrong version, or do we need a, uh, a doc update here for the work you've done? Uh, no, I definitely updated the docs, so I'm not sure why uh, why our actual docs page. Huh. That looks like an issue needs to be opened. Huh. I definitely updated the docs. I'm not sure. Maybe it maybe it didn't get a master for some reason, or main branch. Maybe it only got backported. I don't Maybe know. It's the it. description of the setting, but in the profiling section or somewhere else, you definitely mentioned mm -hmm. it because I remember reviewing it. Yeah, that might be it. I might have, I think I wrote a profiling section somewhere else and it's just not mentioned here. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, because I thought I had re remembered seeing something about it too and couldn't find it. Yeah, but if it's in the docs, then I can find it, sure enough. Well, we, I still think we need an issue to to um, to correct the fact that, because di diagnostics now does more than we thought it did. Yeah? Yeah, I agree. Cool. Uh, and yeah, so this, um, you know, it's just posted the link. So yes, there is more uh, more details here. Um, I just ah, need to yeah. get back over, or maybe just link to the um, link to this part of the docs from from that. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you, Ina. <laughs> Other questions for Jared and Daniel? This is great. I mean, my takeaway from all this is the ORM is great. But if we really want to work in production, especially at scale, all of us need to know enough about how SQL works and to think about things like this. Um, uh, even though the ORM protects you from it, that can be very dangerous. Uh, great job, guys. If we don't have any more questions on this, I'm going to end this recording. Uh, then I was thinking maybe another five minute break for people to maybe get a glass of water or something and then we'll pick up with uh pain points and then everybody can yell at us how does that sound sounds good all right stopping recording